Welcome to lesson 4.3 about absolute extrema and the mean value theorem. And what I wanted to point out to you right away is that the word extrema, you can go ahead and practice saying it, is really all about extreme values. Okay, absolute highs, we're going to call those maximums, absolute lows, we're going to call those minimums, uh, and relative maximums, you know, things that are like a peak in a particular spot, uh, but not as high as other spots, we could call those relative maximums, relative minimums, and right now I just told you that extrema are extreme values, and then we are going to have to locate critical numbers where we think that there might be an extrema, okay? And so we'll find out about critical numbers right at the end of this lesson. So for a moment, do me a favor, just put your pencil down and watch, okay? The way I'm going to teach this, uh, I've never really uh, like focused on it exactly before, so I'm, I'm going to try very hard when I'm, I'm working on it now to, to, to do it in a way that I think is, is helpful to you, okay? So what I wanted you to know is that the y-axis, we should just stop calling it that. We should start from now calling it the f of x axis. As in, I have a function, and when I plug in a particular input, I will get an output. So this is going to be my output axis. It is also what I like to call around this time my height axis, right? That I, I What I want to do is I want to look at the graph and see if I can't tell, is there anywhere where there seems to be some kind of particularly high value? And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm looking at it right now, is it, is it right there, I guess? I meant for it to be on the exact um, intersection there at 2, uh, 4, but I guess it's maybe more like, what, 1.75 here on the x-axis? and But don't worry so much about the x value. What I wanted to do was I specifically wanted to tra trace that height back and say, okay, a height of four, that's the highest height that I can see. Is there any other height that's as high as four? No, I don't see anything else on my graph at a height of four, right? The green line doesn't hit that four anywhere else. Well, four is gonna be called my absolute maximum. Okay, and then is there anywhere where there's another height, like another high point? Well, sure, I could see that my graph, you know, it starts here, then it goes low, it goes back up, and then it goes back down. But I'm specifically noticing that it starts right here, and that's kind of a high. Uh, let's see what height that is. Boom, that's a two. Now, notice that the graph already crosses uh, the y-axis at 2. And in fact, it has another value of 2 over here as well. So that's interesting that it covers 2. And, you know, it, gets, it reaches a height of 2 in a couple of different places, well, three different places. But over here, it looks like it's kind of the highest point in this interval. If I was saying that, you know, I'm looking at this graph, there's an endpoint here, there's an endpoint here. So I have some sort of interval here. And what would my interval be? Well, that's a negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six. That's negative seven. And then over here, one, two, three, four, uh, five, and six. So that would be the interval that I'm on. And you'll notice that in, in when we're working on stuff that's like a piecewise graph or not the whole graph, we might say we're on the interval from A to B. And in my case, the interval uh, A would be negative seven and B would be six, okay? So I'm saying that this, this was my absolute max, but this, this is gonna be a relative max. Because that height, it looks like it's the highest it can be in this section. Right, this section continues to decrease and then it stops decreasing and it starts increasing back up again. Okay, so, huh. I guess maybe here I would want to look at that height and I'm going to say that that's a height of negative two. Now I do see that it reaches uh, that same height over here, but again, this just seems to be like a relative minimum point that's interesting to um, to describe, hey, the, the, the function was going down and now it's going up again. And so then is there anywhere else that there's something interesting happening at my graph? Well, it turns out absolutely true 
over here, there's another minimum. Uh, and this, I believe, is the lowest that this graph goes. And so the lowest that this graph goes is going to be a negative 3. And um, I would call this my absolute minimum. Now, what I'm trying to do here, like I said, is I'm trying to teach you something that in a different way. And this different way is that I'm saying, hey, trace back to the y-axis and double check what is the output. Uh, <clears throat> and if that output is, you know, higher than other places, then make that be your absolute maximum. If it's lower than other places, then have that be your absolute maximum. Um, minimum. Now these relative maximums and these relative minimums, they are important as well because I am going to want to eventually show you a bunch of graphs, you know, graphs that go like this or graphs that go like this or graphs that go like this, you know, and I want to tell you about those curves. When it reaches some place that's high on my curve, I'll be ask, you know, asking you, well, where is that? If it reaches some place low on my curve, well, where is that? There's also a thing that happens where the direction sort of changes. Like notice that from here to here, it's kind of uppy. And from here to here, it's kind of downy. And then up, uh, it's kind of uppy again there. Well, we're going to talk about that in the next section. And that's called concave up and concave down. So I'm going to need to be able to say, hey, you know, it reaches that minimum. And then on this direction, it's going up. And in this direction, it's going up. And then from here, this maximum, here it's going kind of down. And here it's kind of going down. And then that sort of changes directions again. Here, it starts to kind of go up again. So we want to be able to locate all of those points. All right. Now, how is it taught in a lot of pictures? I just Googled, you know, absolute and relative maximums. And it, I'm saying to you that when I Googled these, I was very disappointed because there's a lot of focus on the A, the B, the C, the D, the E on the X axis. And I don't think that's very helpful for you. What you need to remember is that you're going to have to plug something in. You're going to have to find out what that output is. And from that output, then you compare all of these different outputs and whatever the, wherever, wherever you are on that axis, this is going to be your absolute minimum and wherever the highest point that you are as this is going to be your absolute maximum and then in here there will be some relative you know so how do I do this like say it like this in here there will be some relative minimums and relative maximums okay and I did not leave that an open dot for any particular reason OK, so this is what our, our goal is. And I would say that I was looking at um, one thing. I thought it was a pretty good picture of absolute maximum. We got the absolute maximum here and an absolute minimum here. And notice that they're saying that there's a sort of an interval where you're near B, where all of the values of uh, that are around B are definitely going to be higher than this relative minimum for B. And that there's this interval of values that are lower than this relative maximum for C. And so I, I thought it was a, it wasn't that bad of a picture, even though they really didn't, they're not tracing it back to the Y axis, right? They're still not tracing it to the Y axis. And I think that that tracing it to the Y axis is really helpful that obviously this is going to be my absolute max up here. And this is going to be my absolute min down here. And that any of these values that are in between are, are clearly going to be relative maxes or mins. All right. So let's get to work then. So we also have this, this concept and uh, it's called the extreme value theorem. And you don't really need to know it by name. It's just a proof of the absolute uh, maxes and mins. It says if F is continuous on this interval from A to B, then F will definitely have an absolute global minimum or an absolute global maximum on that interval. Uh, really? like absolutely true. Uh, in practice, uh, what? how do we find it? We find it via the candidate test. But yes, I am saying that it's definitely true that there is going to definitely be an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum 
if we're on a closed interval and why well take a look here it is if i'm over here at b and i'm over here at a i i mean either i'm clearly going up right that would be my min that would be my max or i am clearly going down that would be my my max that would be my min or i am not changing heights at all and if that is true, if I have a horizontal uh, line here, remember that the equation of this is y equals a number. Even so, the highest height that I can reach would be that number, and the lowest height that I can reach would still be that number. So my absolute max and min are the same that number right there whatever that number is let's let's give it a number right now just for the the heck of it let's call it uh 15 you know 15 that's my absolute max and that's my absolute min now i know when i was graphing you know from here to here or from here to here you would say well it's obvious it's a straight line Ms. Chatra. i could totally see you know what you're saying in absolute max and absolute min but i'm saying that even if the graph goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down there's still going to be places where there are maximums and where there are minimums. And so we're just trying to determine which one, again, we trace it back to the y-axis, which one is the highest and which one right there, I think, would be the lowest. And so it, it'll definitely happen. All right. So the candidate test says uh, we have a procedure for finding the global extrema. It says find all critical numbers, find y values at each critical number and at the end points. Wait a minute. What? I thought we were about to start doing some math. Now you're going to keep talking. Yes, I am. Listen, right here, this is a relative max. It is not the absolute max. It is at an end point though. Okay. Right here, absolute minimum definitely right there and it is at the end point so here's the thing if you take the derivative of a function and you look at the slope what you'll see is that that slope if you ever get that the derivative has a slope of zero you will definitely have found a max you will definitely have found a min one or the other okay that's from using the power of the derivative. But the thing is, is that over here, we might not know, uh, you know, we might, that might not pop out as a slope of zero right here. Why not? Well, because the function might actually keep going and then it would have another peak somewhere else. And so if I'm artificially restricting my domain to just this number, well, sure, with calculus using the derivative, I will find that there is another spot where there's a horizontal tangent, but it's outside of my domain, so I can't use it. It's not interesting. So I just need to stop and check with plain old fashioned algebra. What is the height right here at this endpoint? What is the height right here at this endpoint? And then compare it to other values that I found first. All right, this graph is looking pretty ugly and scaring me, so I'm going to stop looking at it. All right. Let's show you the process again. Absolute extrema can occur at either critical numbers or endpoints. Relative extrema can occur only at critical numbers. We will not consider endpoint extrema to be relative extrema, although some textbooks allow this, including my favorite textbook, um, which is James Stewart. So um, no, don't worry about calling it um, relative if it is on the endpoint. I'm not going to require that, and the AP exam doesn't require that either. But pause now and try these examples. You should be able to get the answers to them. All right, so what did you get? Uh, you should have found that the absolute max was right here at four. Um, what was the X value there? It was negative four, right? It was negative four. What is the ax absolute maximum point on F? Well, if I write down the whole point now, it's negative four comma four. And what was the absolute minimum? of f. So I'm looking at the lowest point. Boom, boom. I would say that was a negative two. And it says, what was that x value where um, absolute minimum of f? Oh, wait. Check it out. Right there. There's an open hole. Did you write down negative two? I did too. Here's the deal. We have to say there is none. 
And this is a conceptual piece. This isn't something that I'm necessarily going to test you on, but you say that there is no absolute maximum there, a uh, minimum there, because the lowest value that we will get will be one negative 1.9999999. 1 you know, that keeps repeating forever. So since I can't ever actually get to negative two, negative two can't actually be an absolute minimum. It's not in the domain. Negative two is not in the domain, so it can't be an absolute maximum. Uh, absolute maximums, absolute minimums, they actually have to be in the domain. So if you check the domain of this graph, you will find that it is restricted to negative four with uh, and a positive two with an open bracket right here. So that's why it cannot be an absolute um, minimum. So where are some x values that it has at least relative minimum? Uh, there's, there's a bunch of them. Uh, there's a height right there that I would call a relative minimum. There's a height right there that I would call a relative minimum. And uh, there's another height right there that I would call a relative minimum. And he's specifically looking for the x value. The y values were all one, but the x values, let's see, are, uh, neg are uh, negative three and one and two. Now, at what x values does f have a relative maximum? Relative maximums, let me clear this off for a second. Relative maximums, I'm seeing that's kind of a high point. That's my absolute high point. That's kind of a high point. Um, but I can't actually, I've already used this one. I called it the absolute maximum. So it doesn't have to be a relative maximum. Although you are allowed to call it a relative maximum in a time of need. Again, that's a conceptual question. It's not really something I'm going to test you on. Um, right here, it it doesn't actually reach a height of two. It reaches a height of 1.9999, sorry, yeah, 9999 going on for forever. So that means that it doesn't actually reach that height. But right there, that's definitely a relative max. And I'm going to say that's um, the, the y value is three. The x value, let's see, is a negative one. So x equals negative one. And the height, which is f of negative one will be three there okay so now we've taken a look at some graphs we feel like we understand relative extrema that's pretty awesome now we can actually start to do some of them but again i'm running out of room uh in the space provided so i'm just going to do my work over here and all of this is so scary i don't even want to see it anymore i wish i hadn't written it it's just hideous i'm hoping you decided not to write it down either Examples showing the global extrema of that, and there's a process here, and I want to say that the process that he writes down, find all critical numbers of the function, um, find the y values at each critical number, and at the endpoints, choose the least and greatest y values as absolute extrema, isn't as clear as I'd like it to be. So let me say this, finding the critical numbers means find the derivative set it equal to zero to find those horizontal tangents. And then those are going to be my critical numbers. And then I'll check the critical values once I get there. So, okay. so step one will always be find the derivative. So let's do that. So f prime of x will be 1 third times 3x squared minus 2 times 2x. And I can simplify that. Those guys turn into just an x squared, and that turns into a negative 4x. And that's going to be my derivative, OK? Now, I said what I wanted to do was set the derivative equal to 0. And if I wasn't lazy, I would just do this, x squared minus 4x equals 0. But I will tell you I have seen it where a kid's too lazy to even bother to rewrite it, and they just do this. And I'm pretty sure that you won't get any points taken off for that. But I just, if you want to be a perfectionist, go ahead and write it down like this, 4x equals 0. And I'm looking to factor that uh, so that I say I have x times x minus 4. That equals 0. I'm going to set it up to equal to 0. I'm going to set it equal to 0. And I'm 
I just found out that I have these two critical numbers and it's a really good idea to label them as critical numbers. Those critical numbers are zero and four. I'm gonna check my interval and I'm gonna say, I wanna make a, va a table of values, X and F of X values, because again, I wanna find my maxes and minimums in this column. That's where those minimums and maximums are gonna appear. And so I'm saying that I should definitely check a negative one because I said we always wanna check the endpoints. And then I also wanted to check this critical number here, which is zero. And then here's my other endpoint, so that's three. What do I do with that? Well, it's extraneous, it's outside of the range, and so it's, it's, it's a critical number. And keep in mind, I do know the shape of cubics. A gen generic cubic, just x cubed, goes like that, but you know, a crazy cubic will go like that, right? And that one third x minus three, there's some stuff that we're subtracting. It drags these values down right here, and so it, I'm expecting there to be a maximum and a minimum. And if I was looking at the whole graph, uh, I would say there was no absolute because it would absolutely keep going on forever down there, and it would absolutely keep going on for forever up here, and so. Um, ooh, note, infinities, infinities are never extrema. I will never say that that's my absolute maximum because positive infinity cannot be a maximum. It's a number that we keep going on for forever. It never stops. So it can't, there's no maximum. We don't stop right here. Never going to be a negative infinity either. But what I've done by restricting it to a particular domain is I will have something like this. And what will be happening here? What will be happening here? Is it as high or as low as what's happening here? Is it as high as low as what's happening here? And so I'm checking them. But this one, outside of the domain, outside of my domain, so I'm not going to bother checking it. So this is my critical number uh, x chart, x y chart, I guess I call it uh, table of values. And so I'm just gonna plug in my negative one. This is one third, and here's my negative one being cubed minus two. Here's my negative one being squared, and I'm gonna check what my values are. And I'm going to say that I have a negative one times negative one times negative one is a negative one. Negative one times one third is negative one third. And I have negative two times negative one being squared. Well, negative one times negative one is positive one. And positive one times negative two is negative two. And so my answer is negative two and one third. Uh, what happens when I plug in zero? Well, I get one third times zero being cubed uh, minus two times zero being squared. That's going to end up being zero. So then I can check three and I'm gonna get one third times three cubed minus two times three squared. And I'm gonna say right here, that's 27 over three, which is the same thing as nine. And this is going to be nine times two, make it negative, it's gonna be negative 18. And so I end up with a negative nine. And so I'm wanting to know what is my max? What is my min? And are they absolute? I'm hoping they are. And I've checked the endpoints and I've checked my critical number. And so what I'm doing is I'm checking this. Is it the highest or the lowest? No, it's actually neither. What's my highest? It's gonna be that. What's my lowest? It's gonna be that. And so I can say that the max is at, sorry, let me write that like this, is at x equals zero. Aha, when x equals zero, I am at the max. And that the min is at x equals three. And why? Because that maximum is zero comma zero. And that max, that minimum is at three comma negative nine. And this is my highest, um, y value or f of x value and this is my lowest y value my lowest f of x value okay and now we would love to be able to apply the same concept to finding the global extrema of a function by taking the derivative but when we look at number eight uh, 
You might not remember how to take derivative of an, of an, of an absolute value. You might feel like we didn't really cover it in class because I honestly, when I'm talking about it, I'm not sure that I've done one in class. I, nobody's ever asked me to. So I'm interested in making a video on it just as like a specific side note. Uh, but I will mention that you can, you can go to YouTube. There's lots of people who've already made, you know, how to find the absolute value, the derivative of an absolute value function, and they'll walk you through it. For me, I'm going to say that I, I do know the shape of absolute value graphs. So here's a little X, Y table. Absolute value graphs are V-shaped graphs. And so there is either going to be a maximum or there is going to be a minimum. And that is definitely going to happen at a vertex. That would be my absolute. You know, it's, it's, it's a minimum if it looks like this. It's a maximum if it looks like this. And then in here, there might be an endpoint that I want to check, an endpoint that I want to check, an endpoint that I want to check, an endpoint that I want to check and I don't know if it's you know where I'm restricting my domain or where those things would be but they they are potentially um, the other version so there might be an absolute maximum I mean sorry an absolute minimum there or there might be an absolute minimum there there might be an absolute maximum there there might be an absolute maximum there so it's it's the complement of what you've got if you found the minimum because it's it's this shape then you would look for a maximum at endpoints if you found the maximum, then you would be looking for a minimum at endpoints. So where is the vertex of this particular function? Again, I just happen to have this memorized. I know this is a shift and it's a shift, uh, what, left or right? I believe it's a shift right of two. And so there is my basic graph. It looks just like that. And so my vertex is going to be the absolute minimum it's the lowest value I can hit, which would be zero, uh, and it's at x equals two, and the point where it's located is two comma zero. And now I just wanna have a little table again, an x and an f of x table, where I'm checking the, that zero value for x and that five value on my interval from a to b. And what do I get? I get the absolute value of zero minus two, which is the absolute value of negative two, which is two. And I have a five minus a two, take the absolute value of that, I get the absolute value of three, which is just three. And so it's clear that that's going to be my absolute, well here, let me put a box around this part, that's the absolute min. Right down here, I wanna say that absolute max is at uh, x equals five. The point where it's located is five comma three. All right, that's so that's the highest height I get. And I could call two a relative maximum um, because, you know, at the end point, that's the highest point that it gets on the other side of the graph. So over here, this stops at a height of three, uh, but this, this part of the graph stops at a height of two. And so over here, that would be a relative maximum. But again, I mentioned that on the endpoints, relative extrema are not important uh, because it, you know it's just not the highest of the heights. And so it's just not as important. So he said, let's just look for the absolute as well. He said, you didn't have to find all the extrema relatives and maxim and, and absolutes. No, he says, no, let's just focus down on the absolutes. So that was number eight. Um, Please note, I am aware of the fact that the derivative at this value of two does not exist. I can't find the derivative there because there is a sharp turn, which is another reason why I didn't really go over how to find the derivative of an absolute value function. Okay, what what our, our strategy is for absolute value as our strategy is to find the vertex. And I do have a formula for finding the vertex of absolute value. So again, if you're interested in, you know, well, what if it's a more complicated looking absolute value? What would I do? I can, I can show you that. Uh, ask for it in class. 
For number nine, it says find the extrema of f of x on, uh, woof, that's a pretty scary looking function, and on that particular interval. So let me go through uh, the derivative of this. f prime of x will be three times that two thirds, and x will be reduced down to a negative one third, and the derivative of negative two x will be a negative two. I would simplify this to say that the, the derivative f prime of x is going to be two, and and this is what uh, times one over the cube root of x and then there's a minus two at the end all right so that's going to be my derivative and I would love to um, set that equal to zero and solve so I'll add two to both sides and I'll get two over the cube root of x equals two and you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't have the slightest idea of how I could solve that. So here, let me just kind of point out a little trick. Let me put it in a different color here so it's really obvious. There's a little trick. There's always something over one, and you can always cross multiply when you want. But I'll mention that just, you know, look at it. That number is two, and that number is two. So I'm pretty sure that it's obvious that this will have to find a way to make that equal one. Is that obvious? Okay, good. But I, I'll show you the actual cross multiplying now. Uh, sorry, the actual cross multiplying will be two times one equals two times the cube root of x. And I will divide by two, I will divide by two, and boom, uh, like I said, it's pretty obvious that the cube root of x will equal one. And how can I cube, take the cube root of something and get one? Oh, please tell me that you know that the way forward here, the way forward here is clearly that x equals 1. The only thing I can take a cube root of and get 1 is going to be 1. Okay, so now that I have that critical number, I'm going to label it. This is my critical number. And um, also, is there another critical number here? Um, I, I guess there is, and specifically, why why would I go back and take a look at it? Anytime you've got sort of a rational function as your derivative, you know, take a look at, at, again. At, at, it's it's going to be important that we note that you know my derivative will be undefined at zero. Okay, so another critical number here is because it is undefined. F prime of x is undefined at zero and some so something's crazy is happening there and that could be a potential value for maximum or minimum so there's this just little extra step that when you get when a fraction for a derivative consider zero Please do that, okay? So I guess that's an extra step that we might want to keep in mind. Um, so now I want to put together like a little table here of values that I'm interested in. There's my x values, my f of x values. Uh, what is the lowest x value I look, should look at? Definitely negative one. I'm curious about zero because that derivative is equal to, is undefined there. Uh, I was curious about one because that popped out of me looking for that horizontal tangent. And then my uh, last x value that I should check, the highest in my, in, my interval is three and um, these are fairly easy uh, to calculate I know it doesn't look like it but they actually are uh, this is three and negative one to any power uh, any power well we what do we what do we get well let's convert this let's actually convert this like this this is really negative one being squared and then you take the cube root well negative one being squared well that means i'll get one and the cube root of one we already found out was what was the cube root of one it is one so uh and then i have negative two times of that negative one and so this is going to be really three times one plus two times one is two and so that's going to end up being uh, five over here I will say that at zero obviously I get zero and then when I plug in that that one I have three times the cube root of one being squared and then cube rooted which is just going to be three 
because 3 times 1 is 3. And then I have a negative 2 times a positive 1 this time, so I'm going to take away 2 this time, so I'm going to end up with a height of 1. And then down here at 3, I say I have 3, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to say that I have uh, the cube root of 3 being squared, and I want to take the cube root of that. And then I'm going to plug in a negative 2, and I am going to plug in that 3 again. And so this will end up being... Uh, 3 times the cube root of 9, which I can't simplify that any further. And then I have negative 2 times 3, which is 6. So I don't know what that number is. It's a decimal number, uh, but it, it's 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 going, it, let's see, how do I say this? Um, the cube root of 27, I mean, you guys have this memorized. The cube root of 27 is 3. The cube root of 8 uh, is two so you know that this value here is somewhere around two right this is approximately equal to two and um it's on the high side of two so it's 2.1 or 2.2 maybe uh, but whatever it is this value is bigger than that value so what i'm gonna approximately equal is some positive decimal around 0 0.1 or you know 0 0.5 I'm not exactly sure but I'm definitely telling you that it is going to be lower than 1 but higher than 0 I hope that makes sense okay I hope that makes sense so on my uh, f of x axis I'm gonna graph 5 that's my absolute max I'm gonna graph um, this this one and then I'm going to graph this value 3 ooh 3 times the cube root of 9 minus 6 and then I'm going to graph that uh, 0 and so I'm saying this is my absolute min this is my absolute max and wasn't that fascinating because I wasn't even considering um, zero before, you know, but it turns out that crazy business that happens when the derivative can't be found, it is actually my minimum. And so I would say that it happens when uh, the absolute max is at x equals um, negative 1 and my absolute min is at x equals... Uh, what was it again? Oh, zero. Okay, those are my answers. So when it comes to number 10, I'll let you know that I spent a while working it out by hand. And this is my work right here. Showing you how to use the unit circle to get my solutions after I found um, the derivative, I set it equal to zero, I solved it, I found my critical numbers around here-ish, and then using those numbers to make a table, and from that table finally getting an answer. I will post that as a separate video, but I just wanted to mention to you that it's, it's much easier, I guarantee you, it is much easier to just use your TI. And all the time that I spent doing the problem by hand, um, I definitely should not spend time like that on the AP exam. It's a time test. You don't have the time to be messing around with it like that. So I'm going to do some trig on my TI. And I'm saying that if this problem pops up in the free response section, skip it. I just defined the function there. And then I want to um, do this. Ready? Hit menu and I'm going to calculus and I'm going to function minimum and there are three or four arguments you can give to this first argument is what is the name of the function the second argument is what is the variable of the function and the last is your domain so I'm going from 0 over to 2 pi and I'm typing in that 2 pi as the end of my domain and when I hit enter boom those two answers pop out as my minimums and I could do it again um, with calculus and function maximum. And I put in my g of x again, and I put in my x, and I put in my 0, and I put in my 2 pi. And I will be able to see, boom, that 
sorry, two pi, that the maximum is there. So those are your answers. And that's the fastest way to go about getting it.